Hi, I'm Jeff Sharon from UCF Sports Night. You can now watch UCF TV 24 hours a day on Bright House Digital Channel 1. Coming up on Money Talks America, how the rush for biofuels is contributing to the high cost of food worldwide and how those high costs are affecting your pocketbook. It's time for Money Talks America. Yeah. Welcome to Money Talks America. I'm Sean Snaith, Director of the Institute for Economic Competitiveness at the University of Central Florida's College of Business Administration. Worldwide leaders gathered recently to talk about the food crisis, and the discussion focused on how the rush for environmentally friendly biofuels is contributing to soaring prices. Let's get the latest on the debate from Money Talks America's correspondent, Ed Hyland. Ed? Sean, uh, to be sure, there are many reasons for the food shortages we are seeing in parts of the world, including rising fuel costs, more demand for meat and dairy products from some booming developing countries, trade restrictions and speculation, as well as the demand for biofuels. But there is growing debate about the impact biofuels are having on the food supply. More nations are questioning whether to scale back or push ahead with the introduction of fuels made from sugarcane, corn and other crops. U.S. economic advisors argue that ethanol made from corn is responsible for just 2 to 3 percent of the overall increase in global food prices, which are up more than 40 percent over last year. At the same time, pantries are thinning out, corporate donations have dropped off measurably, and funding from the U.S. Department of Agriculture has declined since 2003 by hundreds of millions of dollars. Sean, people are literally having to decide whether to pay the rent, the doctor bill, or buy food. Ed, those are tough choices. Thank you. Let's take a look at how those numbers are impacting real people here in the United States. As Money Talks America correspondent Alice Collier shows us, some American families have started eating more soup, watering down their milk, and turning to local food banks to keep from starving. Long lines at local food banks are proof that the cost for Americans to feed their families is getting out of control. Now I'm not working, so it makes it easier on my husband. And it makes a whole lot different. And I brought my friend today because she needs help. According to the U.S. Labor Department, food prices have spiked dramatically over the past year. Get this, the cost of eggs is up nearly 30% while milk and flour has jumped more than 13 percent and rice has increased nearly 10 percent. Those hit hardest by the sky-high food prices are those who were already struggling to afford it, like 81-year-old Ellie Gill, a widow on a fixed income. Is it tough to make? Yes, it is. My insurance, for example, for a year, it went up 300 percent. And that's more, the, for a year, the insurance is more than I make in a month for, for my income. And I have to pay that, and it's hard to get by. I'm sorry. Some 8,000 people come to the Greater Orlando Food Bank each month. And while that number is staggering, what's even more surprising is who's actually shopping here. It's now the working poor. We're seeing people that um, a few years ago, life was good, money in the bank, 401k, buying and selling real estate, and in a matter of uh, months, um, they've lost their jobs, their hours have been cut back, um, they're just, they're not making it. Scott George believes there's a panic among his clients that he's never seen before. Apparently, the desperate look in their eyes is worse in today's troubled economic times than it was following the 9-11 tragedy. I'm Alice Collier for Money Talks America. Thanks, Alice. That's just incredible. 
The high cost of food is also hitting the restaurant industry hard. The National Restaurant Association says 54% of all U.S. restaurants reported a decline in customers in January of 2008. Earnings have been off too. Some of these losses can be attributed to surging commodity prices. According to U.S. News & World Report, food manufacturers are making small changes that add up to big savings. Here are some examples. General Mills is using smaller boxes of Hamburger Helper. Miracle Whip switched from glass to plastic jars. Pillsbury replaced pecans with less expensive walnuts in some cookies. For many of the companies, the savings are in the millions. While consumers and food companies adjust to rising prices, the debate rages on over what is driving these price hikes. The production of ethanol is at the center of the debate. And coming up, we'll talk to an expert about biofuels and their impact on the environment and the economy. Resources for the Future is a nonprofit and nonpartisan organization that conducts independent research about the economics of environmental, energy, and natural resource issues. We recently caught up with one of their experts, a senior fellow from the organization in Washington, D.C. I had a chance to sit down with Billy Pizer to talk about biofuels and our nation's energy policies. And what you're really talking about is transportation policy and policies to get people to either drive less or drive more fuel-efficient cars. Uh, the price of oil itself will help people drive less um, and will probably help people choose to buy more fuel-efficient cars. But one of the things that we have had as part of our policy and was enacted in the December 2007 uh, Energy Act um, was uh, legislation that will strengthen fuel economy standards for cars. So over the next uh, 10 to 15 years, the fuel economy of cars will go up uh, I think to an average of 35 miles per gallon uh, from the current average of about 23 or 24 miles per gallon. Let me interrupt you. Is that high enough? I mean, when you look at how technology has evolved in other uh, sectors of our economy, uh, computers and so forth, uh, could we do better than that in terms of gas mileage? Are we being too uh, timid in raising that, in your opinion? Um, that's probably the right place to start now. Uh, it's hard to know ahead of time exactly what technology is going to deliver over the next decade. Uh, so I think we have to be open-minded about you know, what we're going to do in five or ten years from now, um, maybe even less time if new technologies come on board. Uh, you know, another element of, of energy policy is thinking about alternative fuels. Uh, so you've seen a huge in, uh, interest in corn ethanol. Uh, you know, there's a limit to how much that's going to help. Uh, but there are other fuels, whether it's different uh, ethanols uh, from sugar or uh, from cellulosic material. Um, and in the long run, there may be battery technologies or, you know, people talk about fuel cells as well. So I think you've got to be kind of open to all these different, uh, different possibilities. Well, let's go back. You, you mentioned ethanol and corn-based ethanol. Now, this uh, had its origins, if I'm not mistaken, not necessarily as an energy policy, but more as a, a way to subsidize farmers. And, and as a result, uh, we're in a situation now where the corn ethanol has put additional upward pressure on commodity prices, sure. and, and that's starting to feed into, into, into food prices. And uh, there's also this other aspect of it in terms of, uh, in terms of its environmental uh, benefit, uh, you know, are we gaining anything by using ethanol versus uh, versus gasoline? So, I mean, do you see ethanol as part of a, a, the the energy solution, or is this just an aberration of a of an ag policy that that has become part of the energy policy? Uh, well, it certainly uh, ha is a very political creature, <laughs> um, 
And I'm glad you brought up the issue of environmental uh, questions because the problem is going to be uh, doing everything we want to do energy-wise uh, without polluting the environment and in particular without uh, increasing the threat of climate change, which is uh, interest is, and concern has been rising dramatically over the past couple of years. Uh, and transportation and oil uh, in particular proved to be some of the hardest areas uh, to get the carbon dioxide emissions out of the system. Um, and as you suggested, uh, one of the things about corn ethanol is that even though it, it touts itself as a renewable energy source, uh, the net emissions from using corn ethanol are actually quite high because so much energy goes into transporting the corn and then breaking down the corn and turning it in, into something you can use in your car. So, you know, from an environmental standpoint, corn ethanol is really not a particularly uh, great option. Uh, but some of the other uh, technologies might be more so, and so we have to kind of be open to that. The other thing we have to be wary of, uh, particularly with respect to oil, is uh, that with high oil prices, uh, we don't turn to even more carbon-intensive fuels. So, so, for example, you have the tar sands in Canada, uh, you know, which is basically oil and sand. With enough energy, you can get the oil out of the sand, um, but that's very polluting, uh, not just carbon dioxide, but also uh, hurts the environment in the, in the area around it. Um, you can also make oil out of coal, which again is a very polluting alternative. So the challenge is dealing with it in a way that respects our concerns about the environment. Okay. So we talk about oil and, 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 and ethanol and some of these other methods of, uh, of uh, producing, whether it's corn or, or cellulose. Or, um, what about other aspects of energy? Uh, you know, transportation is a big, big component of it, but you, you mentioned coal and you mentioned natural gas. Uh, what about electricity generation? You know, where, where are we going there? We had a situation uh, where nuclear sort of ha had the brakes uh, slammed on and we mm -hmm. didn't build any additional plants. What, how can we meet our, our, our growing demand for electricity and you know, where do you see us headed in that particular area? Sure. Well, you know, uh, probably about a third of our energy is, is oil for transportation and another third or 40 percent is, is electricity. Um, so that is definitely the other big piece that we got to think about. There, there are a lot more options. You've mentioned a few of them. Um, nuclear, which has been at a standstill for the past 30 years, we haven't built a nuclear power plant since the 1970s, uh, is in my mind going to have to be an important part of the solution. If we're really serious about climate change, I don't know how we get there without relying more on nuclear power. There, the biggest obstacle is really the waste storage. Um, and for years we've been kind of stuck trying to figure out whether we can get Yucca Mountain working and get all the waste over there. Uh, but even Yucca Mountain uh, with its current capacity would be enough to basically store the waste from all the existing nuclear power plants. So if we wanted new nuclear power plants, we actually need more storage from somewhere. Um, and there are a variety of uh, proposals out there from another site uh, to some uh, interim retrievable storage. Um, but those sorts of questions are clearly going to have to be answered uh, if nuclear is going to become a bigger option. Um, and in terms of, of other opportunities, I think the question really is, uh, can we continue to use coal at a significant level and deal with the carbon dioxide emissions? There are a lot of uh, proposals out there and engineering ideas about how we might capture the CO2 and store it underground. Um, and in my mind, that technology along with nuclear is going to have to be worked out in order for us to seriously deal with the problem, uh, not just for ourselves, but also for countries like China and India, where they're also depending on a lot of coal use to power their economies. Yeah, that's, uh, well, the, the nuclear issue I think is interesting because it's going to make some strange bedfellows because, you know, I think if the environmental movement uh, in the 70s was very anti-nuclear and the sentiment towards the nuclear power generation, but you know, now with global warming and the impact of CO2 emissions, that in that sense is a, is a sure. fairly clean way to generate electricity. And so I, I agree that we're going to need to build more nuclear power plants. I don't know how fast we can get these on board. Uh, the regulatory environment and the hoops that, that the utilities have to go through to, uh, to build a plant are significant. Sure. And I think we need to break down some of those because we're, we're running up against capacity issues in, in many areas of, of the United States already. Let's talk a little bit about some uh, other alternative uh, energies. I mean, in the 1970s, when we went through sort of the last energy crisis or last period of high, uh, high energy costs, there was a lot of talk about uh, solar. There was a lot of talk about wind power. There was talk about uh, geothermal biomass. Mm -hmm. You know, a whole whole slew of things. And then OPEC uh, opened up the spigots, and prices came down, and, and 
those thoughts sort of got put back on the shelf. What role do you see uh, these other alternative uh, methods of generating power playing in the future? I'm, I'm glad you mentioned renewables because the, the two pieces I had to mention in the, in the puzzle are re renewables uh, as well as energy efficiency, which is clearly going to be an important piece of it. There's a lot of stuff people can do to make their homes more efficient, to make their businesses more efficient, uh, and all those sorts of things are going to have to be part of, of the puzzle. Uh, renewables uh, have been an interesting uh, object of interest for, for many years. Uh, wind, in particular, has, has built up as, as quite, a, quite a business. Um, there's a lot of wind uh, power uh, taking off, but it's still very small. It's still a couple percentage points of total mm -hmm. generation. Um, and part of it is where the wind is located, uh, and the other part is the intermittency of wind. Um, so, you know, my expectation is that wind will continue to be economical. It just will probably not be able to rise above, you know, several percentage of, of total generation. Um, biomass is already being used, uh, co-fired with coal. Uh, so you can grow switchgrass and throw it in a boiler with coal and, and get power out of it. So things like that I think are going to be uh, very important. Um, solar, you know, the real problem has been price. Um, central station solar, not the rooftop uh, panels, but these big things that basically heat air with uh, sunlight and then it turns a turbine, uh, those things are uh, still about 20 cents a kilowatt hour compared to coal, which is a few cents, mm -hmm. and you know, natural gas even, which is probably eight. So uh, solar is still very expensive compared to other sources, um, but maybe with additional technological development and more deployment, it could come down in cost. Um, so I, I think you know, the answer is, is that renewables are definitely part of the puzzle. Uh, and in some sense, when you talk to people about, well, how are we going to solve this climate change thing, uh, they say, well, it's going to be renewables, it's going to be nuclear, and it's going to be coal with capture and storage, as well as energy efficiency. All four of those things are going to be really important. In terms of the rest of the policy, I think it has to be built out from there, and a lot of it is going to be technology policy to try to support some of these things we were just talking about, whether it's the cellulosic ethanol uh, for transportation, or whether or not it's capture and storage for coal or nuclear or renewables or efficiency. All these things are going to take uh, support, uh, some initial support from the government in terms of technology subsidies or incentives for R&D. Uh, but you can't really talk about building those things in a sensible way until you kind of have this centerpiece of what's our goal for climate change and what are our emission reduction goals and what's a reasonable price point and things like that. Once you get that into place, you can begin dealing with these other issues a lot more easily. Let's talk a little bit about global climate change and, and how, how do we affect this you know, worldwide? How do we get countries like India and China that are sort sure. of emerging uh, economies, they're, they're consuming vast amounts of energy. They're not very uh, efficient at it. And, you know, neither were we uh, as a country when we were at that stage of development. So how, how can we get them to come on board? Uh, you know, is it, is it going to be cost prohibitive? Are we going to have to subsidize this uh, in, in these countries? I mean, how, how do we make the, the global effort possible and, and who sort of has to, has to champion it? Does it have to be the United States? Uh, I think it's going to have to be a, a combination of countries, including the United States. I mean, I think the, the thing that's missing right, the key piece that's missing right now is leadership. Uh, I think it's, it's very hard to convince other countries to do things uh, when the leading polluter in the richest country is not doing something. Um, but Europe is already on board. Um, so I think once the United States gets on board, once you have Japan and, and Europe all on board, you have a much stronger hand to try to deal with, with China and India. Um, my own view is that it's going to take a whole range of things to try to get these countries on board. One of the things that's interesting is these countries are beginning to realize this is an important issue. I mean, somewhat ironically, it's the poorer countries in the lower latitudes that are most vulnerable to climate change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to be perfectly honest, Europe and the United States are probably going to be fairly okay uh, with climate change. Um, we have the resources to pay whatever costs it requires to adapt. It's going to be the poorer countries that have trouble. So I think a combination of, of uh, the leading countries, uh, the industrialized countries exercising leadership, uh, the poor countries recognizing the importance of the issue, um, and then it's probably going to be a combination of things, whether it's financial support, whether it's tying uh, action on climate change to other things these countries care about, uh, trade assistance and things like that. Um, I think it's going to be a package, and I think looking at it through a single lens is probably going to be difficult. You're going to have to look at the entire suite of options uh, to deal with these countries. It, one other thing is it touches back on a point that's related to wind power, and but, but also affects, I think, the larger U.S. is the is the distribution system, mm -hmm. uh, the power grid in the United States. We've uh, 
not too long ago there were some outages in Florida. Uh, California has gone through so, some problems with outages, and, and it's an aging infrastructure. Is there any talk about sort of extending that, uh, upgrading it? Who who has to lead that? The individual utility companies? Does the does the government have to step in? And and that being said, you know, could we get the transmission out of uh, the windy part of the U.S., the midsection, sure. that would allow us to, to take advantage of, of, of wind power. There are definitely improvements uh, in the infrastructure that are necessary, and part of the problem has been uh, when we went through this period of uh, restructuring uh, a decade ago, the rules of, re of for recovering of costs and things like that were not very well developed for a lot of the infrastructure, and the responsibility for that infrastructure was not very clearly lined up. Um, so one of the things that's, that's been happening is proposals to try to reform that system uh, to give uh, FERC, the Federal Regulatory Agency, authority to establish rights of way for the power lines, uh, to have capital recovery programs for these new power lines. Um, but that is really important stuff. And uh, making it so that the grid is both resilient uh, and capable and is not aging but also open to renewable energy sources and other alternative energy sources, which requires slightly different design elements, uh, is going to be a, obviously an important point going forward. But I think there are plans to try to deal with that, and it's just important to kind of uh, keep our eye on that ball. Well, I think energy is front and center in, in terms of our economy, and it's going to be for decades to come. I want to thank you for, for stopping by and chatting with us today. Sure, thank, thank you. you. It's important to remember that as Americans, we aren't necessarily seeing the worst of the food crisis. World Bank President Robert Zolich recently told CNN that rice prices were up more than 75% globally. And the price of wheat has jumped 120% just in the past year. Zolich says that means the price of a loaf of bread has more than doubled in places where the poor spend as much as 75% of their income on food. I'll be back with my final thoughts on the crisis in just a moment. In this proud land we grew up strong We were wanted all along I was taught to fight, taught to win I never thought I could fail This is my UCF Welcome back to Money Talks America. Record food costs, record fuel costs. These problems are not unrelated. As oil and gasoline reached record highs, the competition began for corn as use in the production of ethanol and also as a food product. This had consequences that spilled over into other agricultural markets. As farmers began to plant more corn and less soybeans, the price of soy products began to rise. These rising prices for fuel and for food have taken a toll on consumer confidence. Consumer confidence has fallen to levels we haven't seen in nearly 30 years. This is a problem. The consumer represents 70 percent of the U.S. economy. And when consumers stop spending, the U.S. economy can be ground to a halt. We'll have more on this next time on Money Talks America. I'm Sean Snape. Like a dog without a bone